We're going to move to our next session. Again, I'm Laura Frerix, the Executive Director of the Research Park, and my guest for this portion of the program is Linda Jing, and she is the CEO of Genective. Um, but we're going to introduce her in just one moment, so I'll go to a set of slides. This is a, a session that Linda came up with as an idea, actually, for us, thinking about how much we share different trends that are happening in agriculture and in ag tech throughout the course of this session, that this might be a very good way for us to learn more about um, how we are interpreting new trends that are happening. So she asked a question, which she'll be talking more about, of what is the next Tesla of ag, or what is going to be a very disruptive type of thing that might happen in the industry. We heard a lot about different ideas today, and so I hope some of those will come out in the polls and ways that will interact with the audience today. So let me go ahead and share my screen and we're going to kick it off. Disruption in ag. So first I'd like to introduce Linda. So Linda just one year ago was opening the center that's behind, featured behind her background here, the new office for Genective, moving its location from headquarters in Paris, France to Champaign, Illinois and Weldon, Illinois, where they have a field station. Linda, can you tell us a little bit more about your pathway to become CEO of Genective, this joint venture between KWS and Lima Grain? Great. My pathway actually started from a farming community in central China. And then uh, I have the opportunity uh, to study in China, obviously, in Switzerland and Japan, and uh, started my first job as a consultant with PricewaterhouseCoopers in Shanghai. China. And uh, then I came to United States. Illinois was actually my home state. Uh, in the US, I went to Northwestern. Uh, in Evanston, Illinois, I'm sure, Laura, you don't hold that against me, um, not UI. Uh, then I worked in General Motors. For the last decade also, I worked in the ag industry. Started with uh, Monsanto, uh, but then departure the uh, departure from the large corporate world as part of a Bayer after Monsanto was uh, acquired. Um, then uh, in the last one year and a half, I have become um, president and CEO for Genactive, which is a JV between the German seeds company Lima Green and sorry, it's the opposite, the French seeds company Lima Green and the German seeds company KWS. So as I said, one year ago, we welcomed this joint venture new company to Champagne. And um, really, this was the last time probably that this international group would be able to get together. Of course, the world changed very quickly thereafter. But there you are with a big pair of scissors opening this new office. Tell us about Genective and a little bit more about the technology you're developing. Absolutely. So as I mentioned, we are a JV uh, between uh, Lima Green and the KWS. Uh, both are the largest in the seeds industry in South country and worldwide, they are number four and uh, number five. Lima Green is actually the largest vegetable seed supplier in the world. And the KWS is a specialist on sugar beet. So very significant presence in the global seeds industry. And the two companies started Genactive to join force in developing and commercializing, commercializing transgenic traits for seeds. Therefore, we are in the business for uh, GMO or GM seeds, which we will talk quite a bit later. Um, we are currently focusing on novel trait solutions for uh, crop to, um, to protect crops from insects, to increase the yield at the same time uh, to pre prevent, uh, to protect our environment because the technology can also help to reduce the use of chemicals. So um, like you mentioned, we were initially headquartered in Paris, but uh, we decided to move ourselves uh, to the United States to, um, to the largest GM market in the world. And why did, Linda, you choose Champagne, the research park, Illinois, as a location for this global company? Yeah, great question, right? So first it's a location. Um, the uh, UIRP is at the heart of the U.S. heartland. We all know um, these are some of the best land in the world for uh, both farming and research. Um, it is backed by UIUC, a, a world-class university funded 
uh, with its first priority on agriculture, as we learned from uh, Chancellor Jones earlier today. And then it has a vibrant innovation community with a very heavy presence of um, ag food company along the, uh, our entire value chain. It was great to hear from you, Laura, uh, during your opening remarks, all the uh, great things that are happening among our neighbors uh, in this difficult year called COVID-19. Um, last but not the least, it's really about uh, the wonderful support system you had here and the UARP. Um, Genactive have benefited a lot from many things all the time. Uh, I would be remiss if I don't mention all the COVID related resource and the support you provided to us from the legal workshop on how do you deal with the force majeure terms in your contract, right? To um, the free and the readily available testing to all our employees as a, as a resident company in URP. Uh, I, I, we, we, I would just say we cannot keep our operations going, keep our site and the people safe and keep our team growing through the pandemic uh, if there's not all the support, the, the free testing readily available you provided to a startup like Genactive. Um, I, I just got the news from our, um, our VP of QM and the compliance who is also in charge of safety. She said 18% uh, of Champaign country, uh, County has been vaccinated, which is well above Illinois and well Holy above God. the national level. Yeah. What did you say? Oh, two shots. Uh, okay, so yeah, 18% completely vaccinated. That is a great job, I'm sure. UI uh, played a big part in that for the Champagne number. Congratulations and thank you. Well, thank you, Linda. We're so delighted to have Genective as part of our community here. And it's been a real pleasure to see the growth of your company and new employees joining Champagne Urbana as experts in entomology and crop sciences and uh, various business functions that are needed to support the company's growth. So Linda talked about her own background, which actually included work in the automotive industry before she came into the agriculture industry. So maybe that gives you a reason why she's posing this question. Give it to us, Linda, from your perspective, where do you see that there might be disruption? Yeah, um, so, so absolutely. Um, I was really uh, lucky enough to start my career as a consultant. For consultant client, always came to us with questions they cannot answer. They are looking for something new, something different. So I would say from day one in my career, I have this mindset about being innovative. And then on my time in the corporate setting, actually is very cross-functional. Being it is on the business front line, dealing with customers, dealers, or in supply chain, try to reduce the cost or R&D, working on something that may not come through fruition a decade later, or it is uh, in, uh, in working with government and public like uh, Dr. Anthony who just talked about engaging and advocating for science and innovation. Uh, I have the great opportunity to really see innovation and the disruption can happen on all fronts. Therefore, uh, a company like it or not will actually have to observe what's going on on all fronts in order to first to be successful and then to sustain its success. Um, I would also say at the end of the day for the innovation to take off, to benefit the company, the customers and society at large, all the stars have um, to be aligned on all those fronts. Um, you know, when you and I talk about the, um, how maybe Genactive can contribute to this summit. That's the turn of the new year, right? Two things happened at that time. Elon Musk became the new richest person in the world. And Tesla's market cap, which has pulled back a little bit from that time, but at one time, Tesla is worth more than the uh, North America big three, the European big three, <laughs> the Japanese big three, all traditional automakers in the world. So we see a live example, Tesla has just disrupted the auto world 
And on the technology front, battery replaced the ICE, the internal combustion engine, which we're all very familiar with. And on the business front, Tesla doesn't have any dealer. It chose to go sell to consumers directly. Every time when the backlog was reduced, it created a sensation. What a smart way for marketing and sales. And also um, on the consumer behavior part, Elon Musk is betting on the days when humans will be prohibited from actually driving. Well, I know we don't have a lot of time to get into dis disruption, but we're going to talk about a few areas. So first, Linda shared a study that Genectiv received, and it was a Russian study looking at text mining. And she's going to share a little bit of this example with you of what might be some of the technology that will change the industry. So tell us about this map and these clusters that were identified. Yeah, I know this can be scarily busy, but don't worry. Uh, we have a list of what is uh, the key topics there. And I believe a live pool will be up there for all the audience, right? Yep, and I think we're gonna go ahead and launch that poll, yep. Yeah, so uh, let me move away this poll so I can actually see the slides on my screen. Excellent. So uh, this is a study done by a group of Russians who did a tax mining among 30 million documents. They do keyword search and organize things through machine learning, and then put the things of the key topic that based on how close they are to each other, they put it into clusters. And there are 10 clusters. Uh, if I can get the next slide, please. This is actually, uh, you have the same list on the pool, our audience. And if you look under the category here, many of the topics, if you're like me, and try to check in today as much as possible into the, uh, into the uh, summit, many of the topic can be touched upon by, um, our, uh, by our speakers. But what is the aggregated view through 30 million documents? Those are documents of commercial papers, patent filing, scientific papers, social media, and those are the 10 categories. Um, you, you see food supply efficiency, how, Dr. Anthonin talked about um, in the conversation with our dean, what's the, what's the future for chemicals? Obviously, it still play a role to increase quantity of the food, but there's also a need uh, through uh, biofortification to increase the nutrition of the food. I'll not go through everything because you're gonna get a list on the pool. Um, but again, another thing, oops, if we could go back one more time, please. Yeah, I, I want to highlight two things because category number three and the category uh, number six. Our concept uh, in, in layman's term maybe sounds very similar. They all talk about uh, plant genetics, um, but group three, sorry, I have to remove the pool again. It's blocking my view. Uh, it's about CRISPR, about gene editing. Uh, the, the cluster number six is actually genetic modification. That is what Genactive is focusing on, is uh, GM technology for seed. Then there are also interesting themes about um, edible insects, basically using bugs and the protein source coming from China. That's actually not a completely strange concept to me. Then obviously there are alternative meat, lab grown meat. So uh, those are the 10 clusters uh, the Russian researchers have, um, have put together for us. And then they also applied uh, two dimensions, two other key topics. So, which is next slide, please. Oops, sorry. And we're going to show a little bit of this trajectory of the circles you'll see on the screen. Right. They put um, all those key topics in a two by two chart based on how much this topic has been talked about and been worked on. So um, they, the other dimension is, um, is this idea continue to grow uh, in people's work in publications. Um, then you will see on the left and the top corner, that's the stable area. That's where a lot of stuff has been done. A lot has been talked. 
and but it is not growing that much so it's not surprising you see gm food there gm gmo crop there but then if you look at the other uh, gm related one there um gm also have some topics actually moved to the right bottom corner where which is saying there hasn't been a whole lot of talk but it is growing the most interesting one is probably the the growth leader the right top corner if you click again there is a bunch of things can be uh, grouped into the gene editing world so this is what the russians are telling us so we're very curious to um to see um what this audience have to say so you so saw the poll, your poll. Which we got the first one was about crop efficiencies but um we're gonna follow up at the end of this with some more questions and give you a chance to talk more about these topics so another is the business model. And Linda, just in the interest of time, we're going to have to wrap up these quite quickly. But tell us a little bit about disruption of the business model. OK, let me remove the pool. Yeah, I want to bring this up because, you know, there's another um, excellent example about disruption is Kodak. Um, most people probably don't know Kodak did not fail on the technology from the company invented the digital camera, invested in the technology, even understand People would like to share their photo online, but they made a mistake on business model. They acquired a company called O Photo, but to use it to promotion, um, to promote people to print the traditional photo versus seeing online sharing as a new business. So uh, really um, applying to our agriculture field, you, you notice that light bulb is upside down because all those ideas is almost upside down to what is the mainstream practice today. The first of uh, can seeds company and ag inputs company just sell directly to farmers because there's digital, there's e-commerce. So no distributions needed. The second one is, is getting to the point, is there even a need for breeding company, seeds company? Because now uh, what if farmers are willing and can share and select just in their own fields now there's large scale data exchange analytics and um, blockchain is going to help uh, with the uh, quality and confidence of the data. Another one. And um, then get into, well, you just said maybe not distribute, no distributor, or how about non conventional uh, distributors? For example, uh, the Amazon, right? Amazon started selling books online, but it has disrupted the transportation business already. In my neighborhood, I say I see more Amazon trucks than FedEx, probably. Non-conventional investors, right? We know uh, who are investing now in ag, but Bill Gates himself just became biggest farmland owner in the US. If we believe in digital, any of the big pack five um, can come into the ag space. Matter of fact, Microsoft is already working with Land Oak for AI for ag, right? And then the last one is, will a company just survive by having one business model? It seems everything uh, we set up right now for the industry is to have a 500 acre farmer as a mainstream customers. But there has been this trend of this dumbbell distribution, meaning um, the number of larger farmers and the, the number of smaller farmers, people who continue to get into farming or hobby farmer has been increasing. The middle part is really shrinking. Well, we can imagine there's huge difference from a huge corporate farmer versus a hobby farmer. So does a company actually have to sp split the business model, have different uh, business model, uh, either to um, serve both end or just pick a path to go either large or small. So those are the uh, some of the uh, thought stimulators on the business model front. I think Laura, you have more to share about the social yeah. behavior government intervention. So I'm gonna to touch these just briefly and then we're gonna bring on some guests to share their ideas as well. So if we think about some data that was uh, put together or thought starters by McKinsey, this was a study they released last year and they had four sort of mega trends that they considered. One is that we might eat differently. So will the World Health Organization thinking about obesity impact what we choose to eat as humans? 
And if we're tackling obesity, will that change the amount of meat consumption? Will it change the amount of legumes we're eating or other things that will um, improve human health and outcomes? What about meat 2.0 and new sources of proteins that come from other sources? The second is sourcing crops from different places. So right here in the Midwest, we're very proud to be the home of corn, soybeans, row crops, and the richest soil in the land. But there are other markets that might emerge and that might happen because of technology. So if there's a greater access to new energy sources or an ability to have irrigation in new ways, perhaps the challenges that exist in Asia or in Africa could be overcome and we would have an ability to have desalinization or other technology enablers that would open up new markets as producers. A third that they describe is about food being traded differently. And in the last two years or so, we saw a lot of discussion about tariffs and government factors that play into markets. In addition, there was discussion about the digital capabilities. So um, we, we talked a lot today about technology enabling new types of ways to yield higher uh, efficiencies in agriculture. So these are just some of the things talking about trade and food being produced differently in the future. And we've got that in a poll for you as well if you wanna to react to one of those social, behavioral or government interventions that may occur. I'll let you complete that. And then we um, next want to bring on our guest speakers. So we asked participants at this summit to share their thoughts. And I'm first going to go to Aiden, who is a grad student who wants to share his thoughts about cellular agriculture. So I'm going to give you the floor, Aiden, to share a little bit of what you submitted to us. Hi, Laura. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, oh, it seems my video <clears throat> may have gone out. Um, nonetheless, um, beg your pardon, uh, cell, cellular agriculture, I think, is one of the, uh, has a real opportunity to be one of these, uh, quote unquote, Tesla uh, disruptive models in, uh, in the future of uh, just the way we, we perform agriculture going forward. Um, cellular agriculture is, uh, you know, it, it's, it's uh, similar to uh, traditional agriculture in that you're producing um, meat products or foods and other things, uh, except you're doing it directly in the laboratory, uh, cultivating cells themselves. Um, in bioreactors and, and sorts, um, but uh, as opposed to, um, you know, raising cattle or livestock or crops to, to accomplish the same goal of feeding, feeding people. So um, I think that, you know, we're only uh, having, we're only going to have an increase uh, demand for food going forward. Um, and if we can do so in a way that's more efficient uh, and is better for the environment, um, I think that's a real opportunity for disruption. I'm sorry, I'm asking our people if they can bring your face back up, but Aiden, share what you're studying at the University of Illinois as well. Sure, yes. Um, so I've actually um, been lucky enough to uh, uh, work with the Student Sustainability Committee here on campus to uh, get some seed funding for a small uh, cultivated meat project uh, to uh, kind of test out the feasibility of uh, how we can you know, begin some cellular, cellular agriculture work uh, on um, on here on campus, uh, and I'm, I'm really excited to, um, you know, be able to do this kind of work at, at U of I uh, and, and through the Department of Bioengineering. Thanks, Aiden. Next up, we've got Kevin McNamara, and he's an MBA student here at the University of Illinois. And my name is Kevin McNamara. I'm an MBA student here. My background largely um, in, involves real estate, commercial real estate leasing and sales. And so you're going to wonder, how did I end up here? Um, so I lived in Chicago for about 12 years, you know, huge metropolitan area, uh, but I know my audience. Uh, I grew up here in town in Champaign-Urbana for 19 years of my life, and here I am again for another two years. Um, and what brought me here? Well, this focus in agriculture, obviously with a great college such as uh, College of Aces and, and ACE, uh, as well as the engineering uh, schools are, are kind of a top tier um, caliber of, of student and professors, and as well as the business school. Let's not um, count us out as well. But the problem is, is twofold, real estate and land area. Uh, so I discovered this problem in my real estate days and this land area, what I called crowding dilemma, um, you know, a simple math, and I'm not going to go into too much detail, but if we kind of extrapolate at a 1.2% growth rate, 
the human surface area is going to meet the land surface area available on the wor in, in the world uh, sometime within the next 200 years. And that's only considering the land surface area. And you know that, that's a rough estimate. So my solution to this and what I see as the next Tesla are what's known as controlled environment agriculture or novel farming systems. Controlled environment agriculture or CEA is an advanced and intensive form of hydroponically based agriculture where plants grow within a controlled environment to optimize horticultural practices. Today's consumers are increasingly demanding a diet that includes fresh high quality vegetables free of pesticides and other agricultural chemicals. Local production is also a major factor when fresh vegetables in, are purchased. In many regions of the United States and the world, climate make it, it makes it impossible to meet this need year round with only local produce. Uh, so one of the companies, uh, there's several of these companies in this country that are doing this, but one that's kind of fascinated me the most is based out of Australia. It's a company called Sundrop Farms and they're half um, you know, producer of, they're producing tomatoes, and they're also half power plant, uh, harvesting energy from the sun, and they're also drawing their water from the ocean and desalinizing. I think it's a very, very novel concept. So are, are these, is, is CEA going to be, uh, you know, the thing that addresses the growing population to eliminate hunger? Um, we, could we grow foreign foods locally, like uh, was mentioned earlier by Laura in Africa, in the Sahara? Could we shorten the supply chain and, and heighten trust between um, uh, producer and end user? Could we have greater quality goods with less inputs, lower water usage? I'm sure the people out west in California would like to hear that. Uh, global warming and, and global uh, greenhouse emissions, could we help alleviate that? And the new consumer uh, behavior, such as ghost kitchens, food delivery, um, you know, I, I can see Amazon kind of peeking into this space. I'm sure it's kind of been rumored or is known. But then we have all these buzzwords like machine learning, AI, robotics, blockchain, and of course, data, which again, AWS uh, has been quite powerful. I've been kind of, uh, been, it's been pleased, a pleasure to discover what AWS is in one of my big, big data interface uh, classes. I'm sorry to cut you off, but we're a few minutes over already. So you heard from Kevin with his ideas about um, CEA as another trend. And you'll see that as part of the trends that we're highlighting. Some of these have been covered in today's Ag Tech Summit and some have been covered in past Ag Tech Summits. So we're gonna give you a chance to vote on those as well. And you'll see that coming up in just a moment. And I'd like to just kind of wrap us up and encourage you to fill out that last poll if we can go ahead and launch that. And we are going to be sending out a survey after the completion of this summit within the next week. And we'd really love to hear your feedback about disruption. What do you see for the future? Hopefully we'll be able to aggregate these results from each of the polls in one kind of input response. And we'll share some of the ideas that were given to us as part of this conversation. So Linda, do you want to wrap up for us of just thoughts that you think are important for the group collectively to be considering? Yeah, this is wonderful. Like you said, Laura, uh, some of the ideas has been talked about in the past, even throughout the today. I really just appreciate this opportunity. We take a systematic approach and really put all the ideas together, give the audience a little bit thought stimulator on the different fronts we can think through and then, then wrap it up uh, with a poll um, of all the ideas actually mentioned here and send it out to all the brain power you helped to attract through uh, this uh, forum. I think we're, we're doing a, uh, a great thing for the industry. Uh, obviously, uh, this is what is the next disruption on the horizon is something we as an industry should be asking all the time. So um, thank you for the opportunity. And I would just um, want to say thank you again. I saw as I was talking, uh, there was a live recruiting ad for <laughs> Genactive in the chat box. I just want to take this opportunity uh, to say, yes, we are hiring. We feel like we can now work fast enough in hiring. So check, check out our uh, job postings um, on our websites and, and the LinkedIn. Thanks so much, Linda, and thanks for all the participants that contributed ideas leading into this panel forum.